Okay, so what we're going to do today, I'm just going to do an overview of um, disability services. We're going to talk about documentation and accommodations and all kinds of things here. So let's see, let me have, see how I can manage doing the PowerPoint too. Okay, so real quick, just to give you an idea of what the technical or legal definition of disability is. Um, so it's a mental or physical impairment that substantially limits one or more major life activities, including the things that are listed here. The things that are listed here are things that came from directly from the legislation, the ADA amendments of 2008. So this is not something that I've made up. This is, um, you know, from a legal document, okay? And I should be able to touch this, right? <coughs> Technically, yes. Oh, there you go. Okay, here we go. That was nice. easy. I was getting, trying to go over to the keyboard. Okay. Um, and then a lot of times um, when you hear me talk, I say ADA, but really, I mean all of this. It's just instead of quoting all of this stuff all the time, I say ADA because it's simpler. We're not going to look at all of these, but we're going to look at, you know, a few of these, some of the major points. So basically, Section 504 of the Rehabilitation Act of 1973. So 1973 was a long time ago. Um, I think people don't realize how far back this legislation goes. So it goes back to the early 70s. And basically, um, the whole purpose of that was to prevent discrimination for any entity receiving federal funds. Okay, now since then it has been expanded. The ADA 1990, um, you'll see the language is a little bit different. It's more inclusive, not to be excluded from participation, be denied benefits or be subjected to discrimination. So it's broadened there. And at this point after 1990, it doesn't matter if you receive federal funds or not, everyone must abide by it. And then probably one of the most important things from like a legal point of view is clear enforceable standards. Whereas before it was, you know, kind of broad. And then this is something you're going to hear me say throughout this presentation is that the ADA guarantees access, not success. Yes, of course, we want all of our students to make A's, but that's not reality. But we just have to provide the access to them to be able to prove themselves and to have the ability or the opportunity to show that they can do it. Okay, I'm just going to go over this real quick. Basically, this is about like electronic information, and that means, you know, website, LMS, that means absolutely everything, right? The Amendments Act that I already referred to. So basically, the Amendments Act of 2008 broadened the ADA even more. So the whole purpose of this was to make it easier to qualify for protection, and so that more people would qualify for protection. So that was the whole point of it. Um, the major life activities that was expanded, that whole long list, the majority of that was um, added in 2008. Mitigating circumstances. So no longer can we consider mitigating circumstances. So if I have um, ADHD and I've learned coping skills to help me manage it by using calendars and different things, um, I'm still qualified even though I have good coping skills. Um, and then the last one gets a little bit tricky, individuals regarded as disabled, and it doesn't have to limit, um, or let me try that again, it doesn't have to limit substantially, but, or be perceived, this is not coming out right at all, sorry, or perceived to uh, limit a major life activity. So it doesn't necessarily mean that it has to, it just like, do others perceive it as such? Maybe, is that a better explanation? Okay. I have one person in person who is like, yeah, you're making sense or no, you're not. So, <laughs> um, and if at any point um, you have questions, make sure you jump in, but I don't know where the chat is. So yeah. someone, you'd probably have to um, unmute to ask me a question. 
Okay, and again, I don't know if you remember this, 2010, um, this whole Dear Colleague letter was based on um, like the Kindle. Do you remember when the Kindle first came out was popular and faculty were using it in the classroom and it wasn't always accessible. So this is in reaction to that. And again, the keys here is accessible to all students. That's the key. Okay, so as far as documentation is concerned, I think it surprises folks to find out that ADA does not actually um, require any type of documentation whatsoever. It does not say one thing about documentation. And I know that's not what most people think. Um, and prior to 2013, those old guidelines that were created by AHEAD, AHEAD is the Association of Higher Education and Disability. It's obviously uh, a nationwide organization for um, disability providers across higher education, two-year and four-year colleges. Prior to 2013, those guidelines were very specific, and it said you have to have a diagnosis with the um, with the dietitian or dietitian diet. Oh my gosh, sorry y'all, <laughs> it's not coming out with the physician's um, credentials, and it have to talk about um, the current impact. All of these very specific things, and I think a lot of times people thought that's the ADA, but it's not. So it's these ahead guidelines. But in 2013, after um, the amendments opened up the coverage of the ADA in 2008, these 2013 guidelines came out. So what it basically says is that um, the first form of evidence is the student self-report. So a student comes into my office and says, I have ADHD or I have dyslexia. Um, I can accept the student's word for that and go, okay, let's talk about accommodations. Okay, you can see some issues with that. Um, the second form of evidence is my observations and my discussion with the student. And to me, that comes down to, do I believe the student? Am I seeing what the student is telling me? Again, you can see some issues with that because if I believe student A, but I don't believe student B, we have some problems. So one, it's discriminatory against them possibly. It's certainly not equitable. And then two, I can put in myself and um, put the college at risk. So the third form of evidence is that third party diagnosis from a physician or a psychologist or you know counselor or whatever the issue may be. At this point, I require documentation for the reasons I, I just said. One, to be equitable across the board with students. Um, if I believe one person because they're more articulate than the other person, I mean, that's just not, I mean, that's just not fair uh, to that second student. Um, I've been doing this a long time, so I have a pretty good instinct. I know what to look for when I talk with students, but you know what? It doesn't mean I bat a thousand. You know, I, I can make a mistake. Um, so at this point, I require documentation. I will continue to require documentation until um, I'm told I'm not allowed to. If Can that a quick question. passes. Yes. And this is Rose. Hi, how you doing? Hey. Um, so is it my understanding that you're saying the ADA does not require um, documentation, however we do for Correct. providing these accommodations? Documentation is not even discussed in the ADA. It's not right. even mentioned. Okay, but so, but we do. Higher education does. Higher education, okay, thank you. Yes, and that's why those ahead um, guidelines, um, that is, and you know, I need to research the history of that. I don't know how that came about, but I think it probably came about because higher education wanted to protect its academic integrity and to protect its standards. Um, that's my guess of how this all evolved. So in the process of the so students report, my observations, and then a diagnosis. So basically, um, these are my guidelines. 
a deliberative and collaborative process. So um, it's not just as simple as a student brings me documentation and I sign off and it's all good. The student and I have a conversation. So how does ADHD affect you in the classroom? How does it affect you when you take tests, when you're doing your assignments? How does that work? What does that look like? The second piece is that individual review. So you probably know if you've gotten many letters from me, you know <laughs> that um, some students just get one or two things and other students have a whole list of things. And it's because of that um, deliberative process, but also that individual review because everyone is different. Just because two people have the same diagnosis, it doesn't mean it affects them the same way. They have different coping skills. So, you know, there are so many things that play into this. The third thing that's listed there is the common sense standard. You know, that is if there's ever an OCR um, complaint, Office of Civil Rights through the Department of Education um, complaint or a lawsuit, what they would say is, did I make a decision based on common sense? Would the average person conclude the same thing and make the same decision I made? So it's common sense. Now that's open for interpretation. <laughs> it depends upon the attorneys and the judge, but there it is. The last thing, and I think Rose, maybe this is what you were getting at, that non-burdensome process. So even though I require documentation, um, I'm probably more lenient than other people in my position. Because like when I'm working with veterans who are working with the VA, I know how difficult it is for them to get that documentation. So basically, if they can bring me anything, I'll work with it. And the same thing, the last time I did this session last week, um, the question was, oh, what about, um, could an adult get a psych eval? Well, an adult can get a psych eval, but it's gonna cost them a few thousand dollars. And you probably know that a lot of our students can't afford that. How many of us can go afford, you know, two or three thousand dollars to get educational testing done on ourselves? So actually, I try. Yes. Um, I'm sorry. The uh, the only reason why I asked my question before was I've experienced people asking a deaf person to bring in a confirm confirmation or like an audiogram that they are actually deaf and need an interpreter. And it's like, dude, like somebody would actually want somebody to be in the gynecologist office with them, you know, and are they playing deaf? So it was kind of shocking to me that I would be asked for that and to know that that's not even part of the law. So that's, that's nice. Well, but you know what, it stands up in court for education. I, I don't know about doctor's offices or anything like that, but um, in, it, in education, it stands up in court. We're allowed to do that. Well, I'm not, I'm not arguing that point. I was just, yeah. Yeah, no, I get it. I get it. Um, as we go along, you're going to see there are a lot of things that I'm about ready to tell you that don't make sense, but it is what it is, right? And maybe this isn't the issue. Okay. Um, so um, that's other, other questions or comments about documentation. Okay, so the whole point of reasonable accommodations is to level the playing field, is not to give um, a student um, an advantage. Um, it's actually to kind of make up for a disadvantage, right? Um, and again, there's that statement, accommodations guarantee access, not success. Um, generally speaking, and if you've gotten accommodation forms um, like late to the semester, um, they are not retroactive. So if a class starts in January, a student doesn't go through the process with me until March, it doesn't mean they get to retake those tests and get extra time on it. They're not retroactive within that semester and like previous semesters too. It's like, oh, I failed that class, you know, three semesters ago because um, I didn't have accommodations. We're not going backwards, this point forward. Um, here are some examples of um, some common accommodations, things I'm sure you have seen. Um, the extended time for test 
I just recently added the word timed because I was getting some questions. Students kind of thought that it meant, oh, if you give them a week to complete a test, they get a week and a half. That's not what it means. And I've had a couple of faculty members ask me that too. It's more time. So if you say you have an hour for this test, the student gets an hour and a half, not more days, if that makes sense. Um, testing in a separate room, the text-to-speech software. So software is getting better over the years. Um, a lot of Cengage products have it built in, which makes it a lot easier for everyone. We also have a campus license for Don Johnston, the Snap and Read. It's on the disability webpage. Um, you can access that. Anyone with a Blue Ridge email can access that free of charge. So faculty, staff, um, students, anyone. They don't have to be registered for me in order to use it because that's universal design of learning. Recording a lecture, we'll get to, we'll talk about that a little bit more in a few more slides. Um, volunteer note taking service or copy of notes. I personally think that this one is going to fade away because I think more and more, especially after COVID, prior to COVID too, but especially during COVID, most faculty have notes or PowerPoints or something in the LMS that students can access. Um, so that may be fading away. My personal uh, opinion is that if you don't do that, it's probably a good practice to do because the students know where to access it. Even if it's not a disability thing, they had a death in the family and they miss a day and it's right there. So again, that's universal design of learning. And again, to me, it's just a best practice. Um, preferential seating, sitting in front, the same seat. Closed captioning. Closed captioning is only required when you have a student who is deaf, hard of hearing in your class, and it will be um, specifically written on the accommodation form. But again, to me, that is if you're showing some type of a video, whether it's in class or in an LMS, that you have the closed captioning and available because I think it's helpful for students with a learning disability so they can hear it and read it at the same time. It's good for um, English language learners too. That's not a disability. It's just a good practice for them. So closed captioning has multiple um, benefits, I think. And then, of course, interpreter or transcriber. Uh, this semester, I have a student using an interpreter and I have a different student using a transcriber. Have you had that student with the transcriber? No. Okay. So what happens basically with the transcribers, like in a Zoom meeting, there is a third party person who is like a stenographer who types like 200 and some words per minute, which is beyond my comprehension, but is literally transcribing verbatim everything that is said. Um, so it's 100% accurate, whereas if you're using Otter or something like that in Zoom, it's close, but for someone who's deaf, hard of hearing, it's not good enough. You have to have that live transcriber. Okay, let me pause there. Questions about that? Comments? Is the text-to-speech software required for, like, for example, like the closed captioning is required for right certain certain circumstances in the classroom, the text to speech software, or do you think it's something that will be required soon? Um, you know, always it's a student's choice. Mm -hmm. I mean, I give everyone access to that, and right. if they use it, mm -hmm. that's great. And if they don't use it, that's their decision. I just wonder, just because I have some PDFs that I like scanned and uploaded, and I. Oh, it can sometimes read that and it sometimes can't, you know, so I just was wondering about that. Yeah, so if a student has that, that's a good question. Thank you yeah. for clarifying that too. So if a student has that as an accommodation, yes, then yes, okay. Yes, those documents all need to be accessible, right, for a screen reader. Yes. Good question. Um, in that ally that y'all use to check your accessibility. Yes. Um, it's helpful. It's not 100% either. So even if you're in the green zone, it doesn't mean everything is accessible. So if a student, yeah. Yeah. I mean, it's good, but it's, again, it doesn't bat a thousand. Um, sometimes there are issues there. Um, sometimes, you know, technology is just incompatible sometimes. Um, but if something happens and the student says that my screen reader won't read this, then we need to make it accessible. Right. Okay. Yeah. 
Yeah, good question. Other questions or comments about accommodations? Okay, so I believe it was last spring I put an ad hoc committee together um, and we looked at this because 99.9% .9 of the students who were coming into my office was asking for extended time for assignments and what um, this ad hoc committee, it was me and then basically faculty from different departments on campus. What we um, landed on and we looked at other community colleges and a few universities um, to see how they were handling it. And what we landed on is that it was basically only for people with conditions that are episodic. Now, sometimes people want to argue about what episodic means. Most conditions are chronic, like ADHD, it's chronic. Dyslexia is chronic. Um, so the way I explain it to students is basically, if you end up in the hospital, then you can have some extended time for assignments. Okay, other than that, absolutely not. Unless it's your teaching style and that's a whole different issue. But generally um, up to two days extension. And again, um, I think it was during the summer, I had a student who was in the hospital for suicidal ideation for nine days. And for that type of um, hospitalization, that's a long time. They say four or five days is about normal average, but nine days was a really long time. If it were me, I would give that student more than two days to make that up. I mean, because, I mean, to me, that's just an equity question. Um, but generally up to two days, and it is situational. So again, someone's in the hospital for nine days versus someone who um, had a seizure and they're fatigued for a day or so afterwards two very different things in my opinion. Um, it does not automatically apply to all assignments. And so um, one person on that committee gave me a great example. So like in an English class, it's um, a major paper is due, the student needs a couple more times because you know they had some type of a flare up. Yeah, sure, go ahead, take a couple more days to turn in the assignment. But if they're doing peer review, on Wednesday and they wanted um, a couple of more days, absolutely not, because that is time sensitive. Not only with me not having my assignment done, I'm going to affect someone else in the classroom who's supposed to review that. And so I'm affecting another person. So this stuff gets really complicated and it's not blanket. You can turn it in whenever you want. Um, when you get that as an accommodation on the form, there is an attachment with long verbiage. And part of the questions that you see came from is guidance from OCR, the Office of Civil Rights, to help you make a determination of should I give an extension or should I not? And it really is about um, the role of learning. Does not turning it in on that deadline alter learning or affect learning? And that's the key. And again, generally not retroactive, but if someone has a flare up and they didn't know what was coming, I mean, so, you know, there's a little flexibility with that. Um, I already said it's not unlimited. And then again, the essential elements of the class or program, um, right? You don't have to quote unquote lower the standards to make this accommodation. And I know this one's a tricky one. Let me stop there. Questions or comments? Nothing is in the chat, just so you know. Okay, thank you. Okay, so similarly, that kind of goes along with this flexibility and attendance. Again, episodic conditions, um, not I have ADHD and I overslept. No. Um, and it's not, again, just like the other one, it's not a blanket um, and it does not permit, I don't have to come to class only when I want to. Okay, and again, generally not retroactive, but again, if someone had some type of a flare up, I mean, you might give a little bit of grace. I mean, to me, you know, again, that's that common sense standard to me. Those are the things that do not count if someone has the flu or if they have some conditions that's not um, documented with me. Um, 
And again, those same things, not required to alter the essential elements of the course. And that to me is really important in like EMS and nursing and um, very hands-on lab hour type courses like welding and auto, those and cosmetology, those types of programs. Um, if they miss too much, they're not going to get enough hours to sit for their um, cosmetology board. So, you know, it's a little bit different for some programs and courses than others. And then sometimes an alternate assignment may be appropriate. And if that's the case, then, you know, again, you have to look at that learning objective. Is this something that the student can demonstrate mastery of that objective in some other way? And if the answer is yes, then fine. If the answer is no, then they don't get the attendance um, flexibility. Questions or comments about that one? Okay, so we talked about reasonable accommodations and I really can't define that, but I do know what's unreasonable, okay? Um, if it's a direct threat to the health or safety of others. Um, there, I can't think of a really good example of this because even if someone has a service dog and there's someone else in that class with severe allergies to dog, the dog's gonna win in court. Um, so, I mean, that one I think is difficult. Sarah, do you remember the example we talked about last week? Uh, I'm wrecking my brain. I'll let you know if I think of it. Yeah, thank you. And if I think of it, we'll come back to it too. Um, I probably should have written that down. Well, I brought up a really bad example about somebody like, a really special use case with like Tourette syndrome and like vulgarity, but I don't think that was your example that you wanted. <laughs> yeah, right. I mean, because I mean, I guess if someone, um, oh, if, if someone's in a psychotic state. Yeah. But I mean, but that's all, I mean, that's a whole other issue because I mean, if someone's in a psychotic um, state and they're violent. I mean, police are going to take care of that. Yeah. Um, Angie, I think the bottom line, thing. the bottom line that you shared last week was no accommodation can violate the school's policies that keeps other students, you know, like you still have to work within the policies and behavior expectations at the college. Right. Right. And that's on another screen or another slide. Absolutely. Students must, um, follow and abide by the code of conduct. Yeah. Oh, your other one was about escorting people. Sorry, I'm thinking of it now. Like the walking people to class thing. Yeah, right. And that is a personal assistant. And that's on another um, slide too. If I think of one, I'll come back to it. Um, we do not, an accommodation is unreasonable if it requires us to substantially change an essential element of the course. So in public speaking, this happened this semester. So um, a student in previous semesters had permission not to turn on the camera due to social anxiety. Okay, but the students in um, public speaking how? Right, the student has to have the camera on because how is that instructor going to evaluate the student's presentation and so forth? So she does not get that accommodation in that course because it's a substantial change in the essential element of the course. Okay, so that's a good example of that one. Um, substantial alteration in the manner in which services are provided. Um, so if for some reason, and I, this is one I had a hard time with too, but um, if for some reason someone needed to do their nursing clinicals only on Saturdays, I know it's a stretch, um, only on Saturdays, and we had to hire um, one of our faculty to work on Saturday. Yeah, we're not doing that. And we are not by law required to do that. That would not stand in court because that's a substantial alteration in the way we provide that service. And then an undue or financial um, administrative burden, um, that rarely occurs. The example we talked about is if um, we had a really old building that didn't have an elevator and a student in a wheelchair or you know with braces or you know whatever, some type of mobility issue 
had a class in the upstairs. Now we would move that classroom someplace else. So the student would have um, access to it, but we would not build an elevator just to get the person to the second floor. Right? So, because that is an undue financial burden. And then of course, how long would it take to, by the time it was built, the class would be over. So those are just those rare occasions where that would actually stand up in court. Um, sorry, Rose, a lot of times people say, well, what about interpreting services? It's so expensive. It is expensive. However, it is not a um, financial burden because what the courts look at is they don't look at my budget with ADA budget. They look at the college's budget. You have a budget of $1 billion. You don't have $10,000 for an interpreter. That's weird. Or let's be even more so, and, it, and this would happen in court, let's big picture. In the entire North Carolina community college system, how many billions um, of dollars goes into that and you don't have $10,000 for an interpreter? So that is not... Um, that would never stand up in court. Typically when we're like advising, I'm sorry. I'm sorry. Um, no, go ahead. Typically, typically when we're advising like just regular clients or people that might be clients on how they can convince like a doctor's office or whoever to provide an interpreter, we make sure that they know that it's the client's preference. I mean, if so if you're saying, look, I've got cart or we can write on paper, we have to tell them it's the client's preference. So. When it comes to the college, I know that other colleges have said, well, you've got $5,000 or $10,000 to build this ramp. That means that you, it's the same thing. ADA accessibility is accessibility. So that's kind of how we present it to people. Right. Okay. Other questions or comments about unreasonable accommodations? All right, so all of this, what's this have to do with you, right? <laughs> okay, so as faculty, it is your job to provide the accommodations. Um, and I hope that you trust that we've gone through that process and hopefully I'm making good decisions. Um, but to provide those accommodations, so here are just a couple of things. Do not provide an accommodation unless you receive a form from me. Now, the exception is if if you would give anyone extra time to complete a test, then that's your teaching style. If you do it because you think that person is disabled, you're discriminating. And this is where the stuff is very counterintuitive. Um, so if you would do it for anyone, you would give anyone any amount of time to do it, then that's fine. That's your teaching style. I'm out of it. It's none of my business. Okay. Um, do not provide less than what's approved. Don't provide more than what's approved. Again, unless it's what you would do for anyone. If you would do it for anyone who asked, absolutely. That's your teaching style. Go for it. Um, treat students the same as all the other students, except for the accommodation. That's the only difference. Document any type of conversations, meetings, and complaints. So um, anytime you have a conversation, so um, you were talking about the read aloud. So let's say I have read aloud, you offer it to me and I don't, um, if I don't use it on the test, if it were me, I would just jot that down real quick, just so I would remember. Uh, years ago, I had a student who was in biology and um, the very first test, the biology instructor said, Angie, she wouldn't use the accommodation. She wouldn't go in a separate room and she would not use the extra time. And I said, okay, just write that down. That happened multiple times throughout the semester. And then at the end of the semester, the student made a D, came to me and complained saying that the instructor hadn't given her the accommodations. Well, luckily I already knew about it. And then I called up the instructor and she said, yeah, so on this date and this date and this date, this date I offered and you, um, you declined. And that's fine. The student has the right to decline and not use. However, she doesn't get to claim that she didn't get the accommodations because she declined it. Does that make sense? And I would just do that for any type of conversation that I have with a student. Um, the other piece of this, um, one of my coworkers years ago told me this, uh, was a therapist and said that he always documents when students are happy too. Like, oh, um, 
like the student didn't want the accommodation, didn't use it, but was still very pleased with, you know, the, the score, the grade, or, you know, whatever, right? Document those good things when they're happy with you too. Um, and again, that if something ever happened, there is some type of a complaint, then you have all your documentation and you're covered. Um, talk about accommodations, not the disability, okay? Um, students do not have to tell you what their diagnosis is. A lot of students will. Um, I have mixed feelings about that because if it were me teaching, I would want to know because I'm going to approach someone on the spectrum very differently than someone with dyslexia. Um, you know, so if they do tell you, then you can use that as a way to gauge how you can assist them. But they do not have to tell you, so don't ask, and that is a violation of their rights. And then I know no one would do this on purpose, but don't accidentally disclose a disability or accommodations in other people. And it was like, oh yeah, I'm, I'm gonna get that test so you can take it later with extra time, right? I mean, I mean, no one would do that on purpose, of course, but just kind of be careful with that. And again, the student can tell everyone else, but we cannot. Um, don't assume that the student can't perform well in the course and you know, don't diagnose. And I think some of us um, with, uh, uh, with counseling backgrounds and um, um, medical backgrounds, we tend to think that way, but you know, resist the temptation. Questions about your role, comments? Are we good? Okay, so you do have some rights too. So you do have a right, to, um, so if the student does record, and again, since COVID, you guys are recording your own classes a lot of time, right? So again, this is something that might end up going away as well. But if the student does record the class, one, I tell them to make sure that they tell you that. It's on the form, but to make sure they tell you, because I would want to know if I'm being recorded, right? Um, you know, that's just common courtesy. But you can say that they have to delete it at the end of this unit or at the end of the semester, or that sort of thing. Um, and you can tell them that they can't share because, I mean, I would not want my intellectual property that I'm doing in class posted on social media or on YouTube or, you know, where, wherever. I would not want that because it is my intellectual property because you're not teaching straight out of a book, right? You're collecting all kinds of resources and things that you know and creating something new. How does that work, especially when it's group work and the students are, are they allowed to record when they're put into small groups within the classroom setting? And they're recording other students. Yeah, so I would be really, yeah, they can. I would just be really careful with that. Right. And maybe that's one of the things that would be a written agreement. Because what if someone says something inappropriate? Right. We don't want that on social media. Um, and an instructor last week said that, that that instructor had had that experience where students were posting stuff and then bullying people because of something they said in class is like that's not okay yeah so we want to try to protect the other students but again you can say um you can't share this you can't post it and just make that very clear and maybe any time that you're doing um group work it's just a quick reminder right don't share that um so here's what Sarah was saying earlier. You can assume that all students must adhere to the um, student uh, code of conduct. Um, and in a situation like Tourette's, again, that type of thing gets a little bit tricky because on one hand, they can't help it. But on the other hand, they can't disrupt your classroom. So that type of thing gets a little bit tricky. But you can, if someone is, um, if someone is, acting out, whether it's, you know, like Tourette's or even if it's like autism spectrum and they're having a meltdown, that type of thing, you can remove them from the class at that time um, until they're calmed down and then we'll get them back in. But um, yeah, they have to follow the code of conduct just like everyone else, because we do have to protect um, all of our students and then also our faculty and staff. We have to make sure everyone's safe. 
So you have the right to challenge an accommodation if you don't think the student is qualified. And please do that with me, not the student. <laughs> so, um, so years ago, I mean, I denied this, but um, years ago I had a student who had like a back issue and she always used like some type of little cushion that she took the class, but she asked me for um, read aloud. And back then read aloud was a bigger deal than it is now because the technology wasn't available as readily available. Um, and I denied that. Um, but if I had, and you wanted to challenge me on that, you certainly could. Now I have to be careful because I can't disclose everything I know, and I'm not going to turn over a psyche valve like see right here. Um, but hopefully I could discreetly explain if you think I've made some type of an error. Um, basically, here are some, some of the things that do stand up in court. So if a student's not qualified, again, like the read aloud for a student with a back problem. Um, yeah, the student's not qualified. And we already talked about the fundamental alteration of the program, the personal need. This is what um, Sarah was talking about. We are not required to attend to anyone's personal need, whether it's like car to building from class to class. I had a student years ago who was catheterized. Angie doesn't do that. Um, we do not do anything of a personal nature whatsoever. We're not required to do that, and we don't, because sometimes it might actually put us, and again, this is one of those things that are counterintuitive. So like if you help me out of the kindness of your heart, you help me to my car because you're a kind individual, you're holding onto my arm and I fall anyway, it's your fault because why didn't you have a hold of me? You let me fall. So it might sound cruel, but it can be a liability issue as well. Um, and then we already talked about the undue financial or administrative burden. Okay, so just recap. So what if a student requests accommodations um, without going through me, you send them to me. If they want additional accommodations, not listed in form. And again, this is not your teaching style, like real accommodations, refer them to me. If a student doesn't use or declines to use an accommodation, document it. And again, that's for your protection. And then if a student doesn't earn the grade that they want or if they fail the class, well, as long as they um, get their accommodations, their grade is none of my business. Um, and sometimes when I say that, students get upset with me because I don't care about grades, I do, but I don't care about grades, I care about accommodations and access. That's my job. Okay. Questions, comments, problems in life? Your piece is on me? Yeah, a lot of this stuff is gray, as you can tell. Mm -hmm. There's not a lot of um, black and white type guidance. It's not concrete. Um, a lot of judgment required. <sighs> I'm going to go ahead reversal? and oh, go I'm going to stop recording and invite folks okay. if they want to come off mute. And I'm monitoring the chat. I still am not seeing anything there, but I'm going to go ahead and stop recording. Okay, thank you.